I do have a special guest coming in um, to minister to us, so I want to invite you guys out for next Sunday as we continue our Red Flags series, and also as we continue to move towards Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday and get ready for that celebration. Um, but this morning, we have a, an amazing, awesome, special guest speaker who's, I don't, I don't want to say guest, but you know, she, she doesn't get to speak that much by choice, but when I ask her, she does, and I know, this, I know this year her and my dad would have celebrated 45 years of marriage, um, and he's in heaven. Um, but listen, what I, what I want to say is that with, um, without this person, I just want you to know, there is no HD church. Without the faithfulness of this awesome, more mature woman, we, there, we, we're, we might not be here today. So she has a lot of wisdom and knowledge from the Word of God. And I know she's going to share a great word. And she is our senior pastor, Pastor Kathy Juarez. Hey, man, we love her so much. Oh, Lord, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. Oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> the pressure, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yes, praise the Lord, I love you. I love you all. It's good, praise the Lord. How many of you have truly, truly enjoyed the uh, Reg's flag, Red Flag series? Amen. Um, I just think that it's just so important to talk about or to share about the family, uh, marriage, children, um, because God instituted family. That is where it all started with the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve, and the producing of family. That's that's where it all began, and so um, I just pray that we're all gathering great uh, nuggets of truth and that we're instilling them into our lives and that we are producing, right? Producing good and better values, right? We're not just listening and then never doing anything. We're, we're producing something from the word of God that we are hearing, right? Because that's what we're supposed to do. Amen. We're supposed to take that word that is preached to us and we're supposed to put it into our lives and then we're supposed to act on it. We're supposed to live it, right? Right? We're supposed to do that. And, and I know that um, no one is perfect. I know that. And there's not really a perfect family, um, even though they portrayed that years ago with uh, Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver. Remember? All those. I know some of you are like, what? <laughs> but those were all like black and white. Uh, what, what are they called? Like um, series. Yeah, series on, on the television. And that's, I mean, I grew up with that. Uh, Leave it to Beaver and uh, Father Knows Best and all of these different thing, uh, series that portrayed like good families, amen, which I think, you know, there's not very many of those left today, but um, I, I just think that um, we should pursue God, amen, in, in just a greater way, especially in the times that we live, and um, every day you have a choice, every day you have a choice whether to uh, pursue God, live for God, you, you wake up and you have that choice, okay, God, I am, I am going to make today better. My values today are going to be better. Amen? Amen. Every day you can. And, and maybe yesterday you didn't make the right choices, but that's okay because today's a new day. Amen? And tomorrow will be a, another day. Amen? And, and uh, the Bible says that weeping may endure for the night, but joy always comes in the morning. And there are new things every day. And we just have to keep going no matter what. And we live our lives like that. We live our lives pursuing God. Amen? Pursuing God. And um, so, so this morning, I, I want to share. And um, it's kind of funny because my first 
two points are kind of, um, it can be good and then it can be a red flag. But my last point, I, I can't really say that it's a red flag as much as it is that it, it's going to help you understand. Amen. So um, if you could just bear with us, amen, on all of this. Um, I believe that you'll get, gain something out of it and it will help you in your daily walk with the Lord. Amen. 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 I'm trying to look at what time it is. Um, you know, because I can't see that clock back there. It's 11. Of, yes, I have it right here. So um, I have a lot of time. Amen. amen. <laughs> so um, my first, my very first point, and you know, I had to go to the Merriam-Webster. And you know, if you ever go on the Merriam-Webster dictionary and you look up the word, then it has this little um, speaker-like thing next to it, and it tells you how to say the word. So I'm just letting you know that I said that word like a hundred times familiarity, familiarity. I, I got to say it right. So I just kept hitting that thing and it kept telling me. The man kept repeating familiarity. I was trying to get it into, you know, because there's some words like, I just like, like uh, statistics. See, I can never say that right. I'm going to look it up and I'm going to hit that little speaker a hundred times so I'll get it. But um, anyway, it's funny. So praise the Lord anyway, right? So familiarity is a state of close relationships. Amen. And this is good in a marriage. And so I'm going to give you the good part of it. And then we're going to give you the red flag part of it. Okay. So um, it is a good part. It's, it's we're to draw closer to our spouse, our spouse, our married spouse, right? Your husband and wife, we're to draw closer to them. We're to get to know them. We're to be intimate with them because that's what marriage is about. Marriage is a covenant, right? Marriage is not just a piece of paper that you sign on the day that you say, I do. On the day you say, I do, is the day that you come into a covenant relationship with that person that you said, I do, to. Amen. Amen. You got to take it serious. Amen, church. There's too many people out there that just think marriage is, you know, let's just sign the paper, and if it doesn't work out, we'll just go to the court and get another paper and sign that paper. That's the way the world thinks, but that's not how God thinks. God thinks of marriage as something that's spiritual. Some, it, it's a covenant between two people, and it should not be easily broken. And we work at this. So, so fami being familiar with your spouse is a good thing. It is a good thing. We get to know them. You get to know them like Brother Les uh, shared last Sunday. I mean, you get to know them. They're picking up your dirty little chonies. You get to know them. You know, they're putting the toilet seat down when you leave it up. You know, they're putting the cap back on the toothpaste when you leave it off you know it's just all those little things that you're going to get to know them you're going to get to know uh what makes them happy and probably what makes them angry amen you're gonna go you're gonna you're just gonna know this because you're gonna look and you know i think back and i think you know during covid because everybody was at home it's a wonder that we even made it because <laughs> I say we, so I'm just, you know, it was just me and my dad, so, you know, he just made me mad one time. Can I tell the story? Oh, my God. It was, it was my dad, my, my little dad right here who's going to be 94. I don't want to go on a rabbit trail, but anyway, one time it was Halloween, this last Halloween in October. So I was all excited. We're going to stay home, pass out candy, right? We're going to do all that. And I had no idea that 50 million people were going to come to the house for Halloween, right? So I was like, oh, my God, we're already out of candy. So I run to Rite Aid, and I buy more candy, and then I pass it out. So then I'm like, we're out again. So I go to my neighbor next door, uh, Coach, Coach Duran, and I'm just talking to them. And when I go out, I don't take anything with me. I left my phone. I left everything. And when I go out, the door shuts. And we have no candy. So my dad turns out all the lights, and he's not going to answer the door. 
So I was talking to my neighbor, and we were just talking, and she goes, oh, man, we bought like 100 bags of candy. Let me just give you one of ours. No, no, I just came to see how you guys were doing, and we were talking. She goes, no, no, you take a bag, and, and you pass out some more candy. So I said, well, okay, but let me pay you. No, no, you don't need to pay me. We're all doing the same thing. So I said, okay. So I go back, and I go to open the door, and it's locked. I knock on the door and nobody comes. I ring the doorbell and no one comes. I don't have a phone. I can't call anyone. I can't do anything. So I'm outside for an hour and a half passing out candy at my front door. And so finally, I go back to my neighbor. I tell him what happens. He goes, well, here, use my phone and try to call your dad. I call my dad, and he doesn't answer because he doesn't know the number. <laughs> so then, you're going to like this. Then I call Pastor Eric, and he doesn't answer. And he knows Coach Duran because they have each other's numbers. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll just sit outside at the front door and wait. And I did everything. I, I banged on the window. I'm like, Dad, nothing. Finally, I guess finally it dawned on him that I'm gone for two hours. And where could she have gone? Finally, I'm pounding it. Finally, he comes to the door. I'm like, Dad, where were you? He goes, well, I wasn't going to open the door. I thought it was a trick-or-treater. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh, Dad. So nevertheless, saying all that, um, I take my phone with me anytime I go out the door. But, but you come familiar, become familiar with your parents. You know that my dad kind of doesn't hear all that well. So I just figure, you know, I better just take my phone no matter what I'm going to do, right? So it's a good thing. Uh, becoming familiar, familiar with your wife and your husband can be a good thing. However, there is a red flag, and we're going to get to that right now. And <clears throat> I want to read a – and I need you to bear with me, Okay. I want to read this portion of a story, and it's found in um, Psychology Today. It's not out of a Bible-based theme. However, it has some very good points, okay? So I need you to really listen. So hit your neighbor, say, pay attention, wake up, because, you know, I don't know if you're going to sleep right now, but you might be. Your eyes might be closing. They might be crossing. You know how you go to sleep? I know I've been in services where, man, your eyes are just, like, going together, and, and you just feel it coming on you, and you're like, man, do something. So... Um, I'm going to read this out of psychology today, okay? So it says the expression, familiarity breeds contempt, is all too familiar. Yet, as in the case with many common sayings, we might benefit from taking a look at whether or not it truly makes sense. When we don't examine these beliefs, they tend to become self-fulfilling prophecies. Ordinarily, the expression, familiarity breeds contempt, refers to often what happens in long-standing relationships and marriages. Regrettably, over time, too many relationships began to see their happen happiness wither. Yet the question remains, is it actually familiarity that causes this disappointment? And it can happen in marriage because you come become so familiar with that person and pastor eric said it right now you can take them for granted you can come to a place in your marriage where you take that person for granted amen because you become familiar you forget you forget all the little things that you used to do when you were dating that kind of goes out the door because you become familiar with them oh they're all right they can do it. Oh, you know, what happened to that soft little kiss? What happened to that, hey, thank you for dinner? What happened to all those little things? Right. Amen. Amen. It can happen. It can happen. 
And so I'm letting you know that there is a, a side of being familiar that can be a red flag. And you have to examine. Everybody has to examine their own life to see whether or not you're in that state of just taking that person for granted. It's just like Pastor Eric said. You could take church for granted. Amen. You could take God for granted. Oh, God loves me. Yes, he does love you. Oh, I could live any way I want because I know God loves me. Come on, and this could be any one of us. Any one of us. Yeah, God still loves me, so I could go out on Saturday night and do what I want to do and come to church Sunday because I know God loves me. And yes, that's true. God does love you. And God's love for you will never cease. However, there is also a scripture that says you will reap what you sow. You will have to pay the consequences of sin if you are in sin. Amen. So there's always a side to everything. It, it's, it's a side into a person that is single. Amen. You can't just take girls for granted, young girls, and, and, just, and, and lose that respect and think that you can just go out and be with them and then get whatever you want. Come on. That's how the world is. Amen, right? I, I know Mr. Lucas said it in another way, something about the milk of the cow, or I don't know what he said, but I know it was like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. What did you say? Get the milk for free. <laughs> oh, get the milk for free. Yeah. Why buy, Why buy the cow if you could get the milk for free? Shame on you. That's whoever's doing that. Shame on you. Amen. So let me finish. Just another paragraph. We might consider, consider whether it's familiarity that's the culprit or whether something else is provoking the contempt. At times, familiarity may be, in fact, in fact, pave the way for a greater intimacy and love. And that's true. It can. After all, when the relationship begins, we open up emotionally to each other, right? And we set the stage for falling in love. If a soft kiss, an appreciative hug, or simply feeling being cared for, right? Right, ladies, come on. I know that, that I, well, you know what? Both men and women want to feel cared for, right? right? You want your spouse to know that, hey, I'm still here. Right. Hello, <laughs> Right? You want him to say, God, you still look good after all these years. Where's, where's uh, Lawrence? Because you know what? Lawrence, after how many years? 50 some, 60 some, how many? 50? Well, 57 and 10. After all those years, he still opens the door for his wife. Come on. Amen. Praise the Lord, right? Just being cared for. Um, becomes familiar, and the familiarity, in fact, invokes and sustains love. So it is good in a sense, but we got to make sure that we're not putting up a red flag by taking each other for granted. In loving relationships that embrace emotional support and respect, familiarity produces and can produce a wonderful life. Amen? However, <laughs> on the onset, of romantic relationships, we seek to become familiar with one another. After all, that is the only way that we can truly know each other. If love and intimacy are the goals, they can only be achieved through a more intimate knowing of one another. And isn't that so true with God? What? Isn't that true with God? Yes. Sorry. Oh, that was hard. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was hard in heels. Amen. Anyway, um, but that's true with God, too, because God wants you to be intimate with him, right? God wants you to know him inside and out. He, he, he longs for a relationship with you. He longs for an intimacy part of you. He wants to spend time with you. Amen. Amen. Stop. Stop making visitation rights on God. God wants to be with you. You can't just say, God, oh, God, come Thursday night at 6 o'clock and I'll visit with you. Man, God wants to be with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Amen? 
Amen. So praise the Lord. Okay, so listen. Here we go. The difficulties that marriages endure are not delivered from this intimacy, but rather are caused by a turning away of each other. Amen. When we do so, we began to take each other for granted. You cannot become so familiar that you take each other for granted. Oh, she knows I love her. I don't need to say it. No, you need to say it. You need to say it. She needs to hear it. Even though you might think, well, she knows I love her. What? <sighs> Hello, what's the big deal? Because she might need to hear it. It's words that are coming out of your mouth. She needs to hear you appreciate her. And not only that, ladies, your husband needs to know. Your husband needs to know you love him. He needs to know you appreciate him, that you go out every day and, and work and supply and, and, and bring home a paycheck. And I know that both, both women and men work today. I know that's just the way it is. But, man, they need to know this. But we take each other for granted because we, come, we become so familiar with the everyday routine of life that we forget that, hey, that is my wife. That is my, my spouse. That is the one that I connected with and made a covenant with. And yes, I still love her the same way that I loved her when I first began to date her. Amen. Right? Amen. Right? But we lose that. We lose that because we think um, she's there. He's there. It is true. It is true. And I'm not saying, my God, you have to be, you know, every hour. No, you know. It's just that one, that, that nice little touch, that, that little intimate um, part of you that appreciates them for what, for what they do, right? And you know, it even goes into your, your children. You can't just take for granted your children that, that they're just your children. No, it's, it's speaking to them right. It's saying things to them right. And it's not just that. It, it's, it just goes in, entails with every single aspect of being married, being single, being, being your children, being your grandchildren. You know, there, there just comes an honor with that. And we should learn to honor and to keep honoring the people that we are in connection with. Amen. Amen. We should. There is an honor, and God clearly states it in, in scriptures that have been read over and over in Ephesians chapter 5, talking about husbands and wives and honor your husband, and wives love your, your wi uh, husbands love your wives. It speaks of that, and we should stick to that because I think that, that there are too many people that take each other for granted, and, and we lose sight of what marriage really is. Amen. Amen. And you know, um, yeah, Pastor Juan, he, he went to be, that went to heaven to be with the Lord. And you know, you don't realize how much you miss all of that until it's gone. Right. Right. And you just have to learn to deal with the feelings of someone being gone, someone not there. So I'm telling you, if your husband and your wife are still here, man, Come on. Amen. pursue that. Right. Amen. Amen. I want to read a scripture to you really in, in um, oh, I stayed a little too long on that first one. But in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse number 10, I just want to read it because it's so good. It says, be devoted in the passion be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family. We're one family, and we should respect each other too. Amen? We should not take each other for granted. You know, I can't take all of our wonderful ministry of helps for granted. They're a, a vital part of our church. Our worship team is a vital part, and I thank God for them. Our children's church teachers, they're a vital part. It just goes, it goes in line with every single thing about life. Amen? Amen? Be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family. Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. 
There it is, respect and honor. You're supposed to respect your husband. You're supposed to respect your wife, amen? Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward him uh, boiling hot, amen? Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with excitement as you serve him. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're supposed to continue to honor our brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? Amen. So be careful with the red flag of becoming too familiar that you take each other for granted or you lose respect and you can't just talk to them any way you want. Amen. Amen. Learn to talk right. Amen. Um, so my, my last little sentence right here, um, it may originate from a turning away from your partner and a relationship philosophy that, philosophy that more likely resembles a me first attitude. And with that, I want to go to our second point. And my second point is pride. Pride is a little stinker. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I can say this, that each and every one of us have either dealt with it or maybe are dealing with it at different moments in our lives. Pride. Who's going to say sorry first? <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and actually, this too could be like a twofold meaning because you could be proud of your children for their accomplishments. You could be proud of your wife or your husband for their accomplishments. But, but we're talking about a pride that... that is just all about me. Amen. That's what that's the kind of pride that we're talking about right now, which is a red flag for your life, for every, any any one of our lives. Amen. And you have to go kind of go back to the beginning of where pride first came in and and that is from Lucifer. If you remember the story, Lucifer was a great angelic being. I mean, the Bible speaks of him as being the most beautiful, if you want to say, um, person in heaven. I mean, he just was, he outranked all of them. He, he, he just was this magical being that was in heaven. But the Bible says that one day pride got into him and he thought he could be better than God. Amen. And nobody's going to be better than God. And God certainly isn't going to put up with anybody that thinks they're better than him. And so we all know what happened. What happened? The Bible says that Yep, cast him out, and that's how Lucifer became Satan or the devil. Amen. 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 And, and so we all know how the devil is. We all know how he operates. We all know that he's after each and every one of us. Pastor Eric just mentioned about this, this devil that goes to and fro, uh, looking, seeking who he could and may devour, and this is what he wants. He wants to fill you with that and say, it's all right, man. You don't got to say sorry. You're the man of the house. Oh. No, come on. come on. Amen. And I wanted to say this really quick, this, this quick story. A couple weeks ago, I had Antonio, and so we went out for a walk. He loves being outside, and it was a nice day. So we went out for a walk, and I was walking around our neighborhood, and I was coming up this street and off to my that way <laughs> left <laughs> I um I seen this really big bird and I thought oh my god what is that bird doing it was on the ground and it just kept going like pecking and I thought oh my god this bird must have something and it wasn't like a crow and it wasn't a, a pigeon it was a bigger bird it looked like a hawk and um a smaller hawk so as I got closer, I was on the other side of the street, and as I got closer, I knew it had something in its claws. And I thought, oh, my God, I hope it's not a rat. <laughs> because if that rat gets loose and it comes this way, I am going to, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I got closer, and then Antonio just gave this big yell, and, and, and it scared the bird, and the bird flew off and went up into a tree. And when it did that, this pigeon, it had a pigeon, yeah, a big pigeon, and the pigeon was like that, and it was trying to get away, and it got away, and it went into the bushes, and, and Pastor Eric was like, why didn't you do something with the, for the pigeon? You could have killed it. I was like, I can't. How? Jesus, how? <laughs> 
hit it in the head. I said, I didn't have anything to hit it with. So anyway, um, I watched, and as I went around the corner, I watched that pigeon go, I mean, that hawk go back down. And so as we came back around, I seen that hawk had that pigeon again. And it was by a fence uh, behind the bush, behind. Um, and I thought, oh, my God, what should I do? Should I try to pick it up and throw it in the trash can? I don't know. I didn't know what to do. But then I'm thinking in my mind, oh, no, they might have germs, right? <laughs> so, so I'm like, I don't know. You know, I just, Jesus, help the poor pigeon. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So I thought, okay, I'll just get closer because I know if I get closer, that bird, the hawk will fly away. And it did. I got closer, and it flew up into the tree. And do you know that that hawk watched me until I went around my street corner, and then it flew, and it went down and got its prey. And I thought, you know what? That's how the devil is. Man, he's perched up here looking, looking seeking. Have you ever gone out of church and then got a, into a heated argument? Hello. Hello. Have you ever? I can honestly tell you, Pastor Juan and I have. Come on. We have. It, it not, I don't even, I think it was in Visalia, but might be here too. I don't know. Anyway, I know we have. And come on, ladies, you always know that when you get into a heated argument, the window becomes your best friend. Yeah. Because you make yourself like, you know, I am not looking at him. And I'm not saying a word. I'm going to be silent all the way home. Doggone it. And if I live in Bakersfield, it is going to be a long 35-minute drive all the way to Bakersfield. And I'm going to count the trees that go by every time I go by. I, because I've done that, so I know. And nobody wants to say sorry. Nobody wants to because we're too prideful, because it's all about me. You hurt me. You said something. You did this. Oh, my God, we're fighting over lunch. Oh, my God. We're <laughs> and the devil's just waiting. He's waiting for that moment to sweep down and come into our lives to try to destroy them because that's what he does. He waits for that moment when you're least expecting it, and then he swoops in just like that hawk did to that poor little pigeon. Now, I'm sure I went back again with Antonio, but I never found anything, so I thought, oh, my God, that poor bird. Maybe it went to heaven. I don't know. But it's so true, and, and the Bible talks so much about um, pride and being stubborn, and we have to learn. Look, don't become too familiar. Don't take for granted. You owe, if you owe them an apology, say it. Be the first one, no matter how angry, because angered, man, you're going to show them. I know. You show them. You go ahead. And ladies, it's the same thing. Don't think that just because you're a lady, you don't have pride. You, could, you can have it too. There's no, no disclaimer in the Bible that says pride is only a man. There's no, it, pride is pride, right? Amen. And we have to make sure that we're okay, right? Um, C.S. Lewis, I don't know if you ever read anything about him, but he's good. He says that pride has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Since the world began, because it began with the devil. Amen? So I'm just telling you, and there's so many more scriptures about pride. I didn't read them all, but Proverbs 11, 2, Proverbs 16, 5, Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying, because we're doing this red, red flag series, I'm just saying, let's, let's, be careful. Let's watch our lives. Let's, let's um, examine. We should examine our life every day. We should examine our own heart. Not, not your spouse's heart, your heart. You examine you and you see if you're right and, and doing right with God. That's, that's the best thing to do. Amen. And keeping our hearts right. Because that does not the Bible say to do that keeping your heart right before God. And so this, this last point, 
and we're going to close. Um, I had some other things, but maybe another day, right? Praise the Lord. So my third point is, is I don't think it's a red flag, but I wanted to put it in there because I, honestly, I did want to pray. I wanted to have people come up that, that maybe just need that prayer. We're not going to lay hands on everyone, but we're going to collectively come together and pray. And my third point is restoration because um, that means it's an act of repairing. It's rebuilding. It's reconstruction of something that was broken to a state of good condition, a state of brand new. That's what restoration is. And if there's anybody that knows how to mend a broken heart, if there's anybody that knows how to put a marriage back together, if there's anybody that knows what it is that you're going through that you need that just that connection with God, if there's anyone that can restore a marriage that has been damaged, is Jesus. He's the one. He's the one. And, and, and man, the Bible talks a lot about restoration and and first peter um, 5 10 it says and then after your brief suffering i love this it's in the passion after your brief suffering the god of all loving grace who has called you to share in his eternal glory in christ will personally personally and powerfully restore you and make you stronger than ever yes he will set you firmly in place and build you up and he has all the power needed to do this god does god has all the power that you need for him to restore you and there's just one more scripture that i want to read and i think that this is the most tender portion of scripture that I have ever found in the Bible and it's Psalms 51 because it's David's prayer and if there was any anyone that was broken and if there was anyone that was hurt for the things that he had done if there was anyone that disconnected himself from God and just began to live his own life if there was anyone like that who who did the sins that he did was David when he when he found Bathsheba when he had Bathsheba's husband murdered I mean he did all these things just because he wanted to and so this is David's heart felt prayer this is his cry because he was so distraught um, about the things that he had done against his God this was his heartfelt prayer he said God give me mercy from your foundation of forgiveness I know your abundant love is enough to wash away my guilt because your compassion is so great take away this shim shameful guilt of sin Forgive the full extent of my rebellious ways and ease this deep stain of my conscience. For I am ashamed and I feel such pain and anguish within me. Have you ever been in a place where you just feel like that? I'm sorry, God. I'm so sorry. I should have never said the words I did. I should have never done what I did. I should have never. God, I'm so sorry. Because you feel so broken and hurt. Amen. He said, I'm in, in pain and anguish, and I can't get away from the sting of my sin against you. Everything I did, I did right in front of you. This is someone that truly, this is someone that truly wanted to repent. This is someone that was truly sorry for the things that he did against his God. This is what he, he was saying. Everything I did, I did in front of you, and you saw it all. Against you and you above have I sinned. Everything you say to me is infallibly true, and your judgment conquers me. Lord, I have been a sinner from my birth, from the moment my mother conceived me. But I know that you delight to set your truth deep in my spirit. So come into the hiding places of my heart and teach me wisdom. Purify my conscience 
Make this leopard clean again. Wash me in your love until I am pure in heart. In another translation, he says, restore unto me, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Amen. If there's anybody that can restore, is God. Amen. And this morning, not because there's things wrong with you, but because I just feel like we should pray for families. That's that's was in my heart, and that's what God told me to do. So you don't have to come up, but I, I would like you to come up. Amen. And we're just going to pray collectively together as we close this portion of, of red flags um, today. I just want to pray. I want to pray that God would strengthen families. And maybe if you are here this morning and you do have something in your life that, man, I blew it, I messed up, God, I, I want to fix this with you. I don't want to be apart from you. This is your moment. This is the time to say, God, here I am. Amen. So come on. Come on, families. Let's just come up and let's pray. We're just going to come together in agreement. Everyone, I'm, I'm talking like singles, all of you. Amen, because we all need this. Amen, we just, we need prayer. We need, we, we need it in our lives. No one is perfect. There's not a perfect family. There's not a perfect person. We all strive to do what God has called us to do. Amen, and I'm praying for just strength in marriages and, and praying for single people that, that, man, you just search God and his heart rather than searching for a spouse. Amen? You don't need to do that. God will bring them to you. Search for God. Search for God. Amen? Search for God. Amen? So let's pray. I'm just going to pray as a, just general. I'm going to pray for marriages that God would continue to strengthen our marriages. I'll just pray for each individuals amen because i just believe that hd church man we're we're here to get some things done amen we're here to accomplish some things in the kingdom amen and we're going to do it but i think the unit family needs to be strong amen amen so let's pray father we just love you we just praise you we thank you for this moment right now god you are the God of restoration. And God, whether we need that in our lives, I think all of us do, Father. We all need to have that joy of our salvation or that joy of, of marriage brought back into our lives. That we appreciate our spouse. We love our spouse. We love the one that you connected us with, God. We love them, Father God, and we will not take them for granted. And we will not become so familiar that we forget to say, I love you. Or we forget to, to give them a, a hug of appreciation for, for what they do and, and for, for, for the meal that they make or for whatever it is, God. Just the little things, God. The little things that they might do, God. We just thank you, Father. I just thank you for bringing that back to us, God. Reminding us of, of the covenant that we made as we stood at the altar and we said, I do, God. We made that covenant with them and we made that covenant with you that we will remain married throughout the years of our life, Jesus. And so I thank you for that. Make us stronger than ever, God. Restore the joy of our marriage again, Father, in the name of Jesus, God. I just thank you for it that you'll draw us closer than ever before, God. In Jesus' name, I thank you, God. I pray for every single person, God, that may not be married, that is single here, God. May they just have a heart to call out for you, that, Father, they may want to pursue you as their God, as their Lord and Savior, God, that they might want to become more acquainted with you on a deeper level, God, not to become so familiar that they take you for granted, that they live any way they want, God, but but that they say, no, God, I want to serve you and I want to be close to you. And I know that one day you will bring me the right person at the right time. 
Thank you, Jesus. I pray for all those, Father, that, that may be widowed, Father, that may be a widow or a widow, God. I just pray that you would give them strength. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation, the joy of connecting with you, God. You said that you are our husband, that you are the connector with that we, we make with, God. And so I thank you for that. I thank you for not, not giving up on us. I thank you that you are with us, that you are still, God, that you are still our God. God, and that you, Father God, will continue to walk with us and talk with us, and you'll lead us and guide us in the path that we should go. And Father, most of all, I just pray for HD Church. I pray that every family will be structured by you, that we will gain a strength and a momentum and a spirit of unity and faith like never before, God, so that we could be the light to our community, so that we could reach out and touch the lives of people that are here, God that don't know you, Father. And I thank you and I praise you for your word. May it fall deep into our hearts. May it fall deep into our lives and may we take this. And Father God, may we not just hear it, but may we do something with it, God. We just praise you and we just thank you for it, God. We love you and we praise you that your spirit is here and that you're touching lives today, this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I just want you to know, church, that I love you. I love you, and I'm... If we're here another 40 years, I'll be here. I'll be like Papa Joe, but I'll be here. Papa Joe's going to be 94 in two weeks. Wow. And he's still going strong. Amen. 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 Well, I pray that you have a blessed day today. Uh, say something good to your spouse. Amen. Good morning, HD Church. Good morning. We want to welcome you. If you are visiting with us or watching online or watching the replay, we want to say welcome. Thank you for, for joining us. If you are watching online or you're watching the replay and you do not attend, I just want to, you to know that you are more than welcome to uh, attend or be a part of this church. I know there's been plenty of people that started watching online and then started showing up. Um, we all know this from all kinds of things in life that it's always different when you're here in person. Amen. It's great that you could receive the word of God online through your phone, tablet, or TV, but it's uh, very, it just, it's nourishing to be here and be in the presence of God and be with our brothers and sisters that are here um, this morning. I have the privilege and honor of receiving our tithes and offerings. Amen. Amen. Our tithes, thank you for that one clap. Thank you for that one clap. And I'm grateful that uh, my wife is here this morning. She was able to sneak out, get out of work and be here this morning. And also my wonderful mother-in-law, who God has miraculously healed, right? And continuing to heal. Yeah, yeah, that's a story for another day, but God is, God is good. And we, we, we continue to pray and believe for all of you guys, is your health and your healing, no matter whether it's physical or emotional, mental, whatever, um, God is the healer. Second Corinthians chapter 9 out of the ESV in verse 6 says this. It says, to this point, and Paul is speaking and he's writing. And he just got done in chapter 8 speaking about a church in uh, the city of Macedonia that, that just kind of kind of took generosity to the next level. You ever get a chance? Read 2 Corinthians chapter 8. There's a church there that where Paul says that, man, they, they, they were so excited to help, to be a part, to sow and to give, um, that they got so excited that they not only gave from their means, but the Bible says that they gave beyond their means. And Paul goes on to say in, in chapter 9, he says, to this point, to the, to the point is this, he says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound. There's that grace again. 
All grace abounds to you so that having all sufficiency in all things, at all times, you may abound in every good work. So God is saying this, look, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's practical. There's a principle behind it. But when you're generous, guess what? The principle is this, that when you are generous in your life, you will reap generosity. That's what the scripture teaches. And I, and I believe most of us know this. And when you are, when you are stingy, or when you hold back, then, then you can expect to reap something similar to that. But, but, but Paul says this, he says, when you are generous, you will reap generosity. And then he says this, he says, why? Because God will be able to increase you in all sufficiency. Why? So you can be rich in good works. So you're able to do what you're able to do. Now, I want to say something real quick about, about tithe and off, the tithes and offerings. In the Old Testament, when everything was taking place, there was a man named, I think I'm going to say his name right, Melchizedek. Am I right? Yes. And he went, um, before, there was a, before there was a law of tithing, and he went and he um, gave 10% of his crop to Moses. Am I right, Jesse? You got to help me. Abraham, Moses or Abraham, Abraham. My point is this, is that Melchizedek gave a tenth of his crop, his share. What am I? Am I right, Abraham? Okay, it's like, I don't know, I'm crazy here. <laughs> it doesn't matter. My point is this, is that before, before the law came into effect, that he did this before the law. Now, I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm trying to promote tithing, tithing. I'm just saying this, then the law came in. And the law in the Old Testament said, hey, look, the tithe is this. It's, it's 10% of what you get, okay? Now, that, that was all, that all happened in the Old Testament. Then the New Testament comes. And here's what I want to tell you about the New Testament. The theme of the New Testament is not tithing. It's generosity. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't take tithing and we say, man, this is a really good rule of thumb here. All right? I'm talking to everybody that's a part of HD Church, that's a member here that is supporting this church, it's a really good rule of thumb. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. We always say the tithe and the offerings. But all throughout the New Testament, there is this theme of generosity where Paul says things like, each of you should decide in your own heart. Right? Without arm twisting, without me trying to make you feel bad, without me trying to push you to have to give. That's not what I want to do. You know what I want to do? Is I'm, my prayer is that, is that you are so thankful to God for all that he's done in your life that you're like, I know about that grace, Eric, what I did not deserve. And man, I, I know about that, that mercy. What I, I know what I did deserve, but God did not give it to me. And I'm so thankful for that that I read throughout the scriptures that I have a responsibility that this is my house. This is where I feed my children spiritually at times. This is where my soul gets fed on Sundays. I believe in the, the leadership of this team, of this church. I believe what this church does is good for us, and it's good for our city. Therefore, man, I want to be a part of giving. And so every time I, I come in, man, man, God, I'm not shortchanging you. I'm praying, and I'm saying, God, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? Within my means, listen, and beyond my means, God, what would you have me do? Because whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously, what? Will also reap generously. And I want to read some things to you real quick about the benefits of generosity. And number one is this, increased joy. And these are studies here. Increased joy. Studies have shown that when people engage in acts of kindness or generosity, that they experience a boost in their mood and a sense of happiness or newfound joy. Number two, improved relationships. When you are generous, people tend to feel more positively towards you, listen, and are more likely to re reciprocate your kindness. That's what happened in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This can lead to stronger relationships and a greater sense of connection with Others. Number three, reduced stress. Anybody can use some more of that? Generosity has been shown to reduce stress and anxiety levels by focusing on the needs of others. 
we can shift our attention away from our own worries and concerns, leading to a greater sense of peace and calm. And we've experienced that in our own lives. Man, when you help meet the needs of someone else, it feels good. You feel, you feel proud that I was, man, I was, God, thank you for allowing me to help someone else that was struggling. And now they have that peace and calm in their lives because thank you, Lord, that I was able to be there for them. Number four, enhanced sense of purpose. This is important. Engaging in acts of generosity can give us a sense of purpose and meaning in life when we know we are making a positive impact on the world. It helps us feel more fulfilled and satisfied in our own lives. And the last one is this, number five, improved physical health. Studies have shown that people who engage in acts of generosity tend to have lower blood pressure, better immune system function, and a lower risk of chronic diseases. This may be, be because generosity is associated with lower levels of stress and inflammation in the body. So once again, whenever you're generous, not only are you meeting the needs of others and giving them peace and a calmness, but you yourself are developing that own peace supernaturally and calmness that only God can give when you are able to meet the needs of someone else. And so I want to encourage you this morning, whether you look at the scripture and say, man, you know, I'm a tither, I'm a giver, great. And you look at the scripture and you say, I hear you about generosity, Pastor Eric, and I believe I could, I, I believe I need to do my part. Or some of you in here, you believe I, I need to step it up. I need to do more. That's okay. You go to God and you ask him. And I just wanted you to know that, that not only spiritually, but, but physically, mentally, emotionally, when you learn to be a giver, God continues to bless us in every which way. Ushers, are you ready? Do me a favor. Let's stretch our hands out towards our seed. Father, we thank you for the seed that we get to sow. Father, thank you that we came in here this morning able to cast our cares upon you, able to feel your presence and your love. Thank you for your mercy and grace, Lord. Um, I thank you for everyone that is given this morning. I thank you for everyone that has sown, that we believe what your word says, that we believe that when we give out of a, a cheerful heart, when we obey you, when we trust you, Lord, that, that we can believe that you have a return for us, that you have good things for us. And so I, I pray for every person that is given, Lord, continue to bless them, increase them in every way in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>